Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, this is basically a story about an attempt to understand the relationship between health and well-being in the physical urban environment in a particular context in Cape Town. And part of that context is overall low density, which is a very different issue to that in, in Hong Kong. Um, first of all, just to, to basically look at, the, to look at, part, at some of the key features of the context of Cape Town. Firstly, it's got a population of about 3.7 million, sort of give and take half a million. We don't, no one's really sure what the actual population is because the last census was in 2001. Very high levels of poverty and inequality. The Gini coefficient is higher than any other non-South African city in the world. Um, and there are an estimated 280,000 households living in informal dwellings. Um, the spatial structure of Cape Town is very sprawling and segregated spatial structure with a very low average density. There are some high density pockets, but the average density is probably about, there are many different estimates, but probably about 3,000 people per square kilometer is a, is a reasonable estimate. Um, an important feature to note is that poorer residents are <coughs> largely located in peripheral areas. So that, and they are particularly negatively impacted by this spatial form. Um, so, because so, one of the, one of like the implications of the spatial form is that there's no, there's no effective public transport system, which means, as someone mentioned in the case of Sao Paulo, a lot of the poorer people are ex essentially excluded from the labor market. Um, in terms of health, Cape Town, as with other South African cities, has a very high and very complex burden of disease, what can be called the quintuple burden of disease. There's HIV AIDS, which is a major, the leading cause for premature mort mortality. There are very high levels of other communicable diseases, such as TB. There's very rapidly increasing chronic disease, such as diabetes and so on, and cardiovascular disease. There are very high levels of injuries, such as murder and traffic accidents, and there are very high levels of psychosocial stress and depression. So it makes it a very high burden of disease and very complex. Um, also important to note that the very high levels of health inequities. So Cape Town is divided into about five very large health districts. And if you compare the indicators for these different health districts, you can find that um, indicators can vary by up to five times. Like communicable diseases vary by five times between the Kailicha subdistrict and the South Peninsula subdistrict. This just <coughs> This is just an indication of the socio-spatial inequalities of Cape Town. The, this basically measures the so socio-economic index. It's basically a sort of human development index. The red areas are basically the, the low-income areas. Pink areas are the, the lower middle-income areas. And then the green areas are the upper middle-income and high-income areas. You can see enormous spatial separation of different socio-economic groups. This is just an indication of how much the, the health indicators vary between two selected health districts. You can, look, you can see all the, all the indicators for the Kailicha district are enormously more than for, the, for one of the other sort of higher income health districts in Cape Town. Um, this, is the, this is basically how the city looks. The original historic core is in that bowl surrounded by mountains, just the old suburbs along the edge of the mountains. It was initially developed along rail routes and tram lines. From World War I onwards, you had spread onto that flat sandy plain to, to your left. And that was largely driven by the, <coughs> by the great influenza epidemic of 1918-1919. When you, within three years of that epidemic, you had middle-income households moving out into new garden suburbs on, on that plain. You had the Garden Cities Company set up, I think, in 1919. <coughs> and by 1922, <coughs> there was the first township of slum dwellers forcibly relocated onto sort of separated neighbor, neighborhood units on, onto that flat sandy plain. And, <coughs> and whether voluntary or forced, all of that new development pretty much followed the same sort of form of one house on a plot development in segregated neighborhood units and garden suburbs and so on. This is just the center of Cape Town. This flat, I mean this 
empty piece of land in the foreground used to be the densest, the most vibrant part of Cape Town. It was demolished and the residents were forcibly relocated in the 60s and 70s. This is a typical informal settlement in Cape Town. <coughs> the informal settlements in Cape Town are the densest parts of the city. Uh, mainly a large proportion of them are migrants from rural areas but who've been living in Cape Town for many decades. There are some basic services but never enough and they never work well enough. Um, so basically, part of the problem in Cape Town is that health has completely fallen off the urban agenda for various reasons, such as lack of data and various competing discourses and competing political priorities. And the existing body of knowledge around how to create healthy cities isn't really appropriate in our context or of limited use in our context. So essentially we set up a Healthy City Study Lab, which is an interdisciplinary group bringing together researchers from different disciplines, try and research the key issues relating to health and the urban environment in Cape Town, um, and to engage with policymakers and civil society groups and try and improve living conditions and health and well-being in Cape Town. Um, so the first phase of the, of the research has been completed. It has involved workshops and focus groups with residents of different types of neighborhoods um, and also various quantitative measures. Some of the preliminary findings of the fieldwork that have come out so far. Um, firstly, it highlights that health and well-being is a very complex sort of issue and it has to be understood in a very nuanced and very context-specific way. Uh, I think the fieldwork also confirms that the neighborhood physical urban environment does have a very significant impact on the health and well-being of residents and residents understand this impact very well. So through, when in the workshops when residents were drawing the urban environment and they had to take photographs of the key features of the urban environment, they understood very well what impacted negatively and positively on their health and well-being. <coughs> and also, we found that the way that the urban environment is used is also very complex. So the social context sort of impacts on that quite a, quite a lot. So you find, for example, that fear of violent crime greatly constrains use of outdoor space. So you would find that people, oh, okay, sorry, can I just have 20 seconds? So you would find that people would often not use, they would, they would only use major routes, they wouldn't walk through other neighborhoods, they would avoid public space, they wouldn't walk at night, and so on. And also the, the biggest problem is a lot of low-income residents are in the especially marginalized areas on the periphery of the city, um, completely cut off from socioeconomic opportunities. So essentially the next phase of the research program will be trying to work towards grappling with some of these issues and trying to look at interventions at the local neighborhood scale and at the city-wide scale to try and improve health and well-being. Thanks. Um, thank you.